Hey, I'm Kat, and welcome to Newport Mesa Church Online. Before we get started, we just want to take a moment to describe what you're going to experience today. Not only will you hear some awesome worship and a hopeful message from one of our pastors, but on the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a live chat, and we'd love for you to send some likes, as well as share how this experience is impacting you. You'll also have opportunities to find out more about who we are, as well as a chance to take your next step. Whether that's filling out a Connect card, saying, I want to give my life to Jesus, or getting connected with a small group. We've got lots of options for you to build relationships because we truly believe that life isn't meant to be done alone. If you'd like to partner with us so that we can bring more experiences like this to many others, you can click give at the top right of your screen and select what option works best for you. Well, the experience is just about to start, so let's jump in as our band leads us into worship. Welcome to Newport Mesa Online. We're so glad you guys are joining us today. Let's worship the Lord together. Come on. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven come on my praise yeah my, my praise belongs to my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, hope all with, all for blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. My story, I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Whoa. Well, we're here to declare that God is faithful to us all. If I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things are still to come. Dead, you're not done. 
greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace we wrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
is no doubt Cause I have seen your faithfulness My fortress over and over You know church, we serve a God whose faithfulness nothing and no one compares to who our God is. And in these times, like what we're going through today, can I let you know that our God is in control and that He cares for you, He cares for me, and that in spite of all the things and all the circumstances that are happening, we have the opportunity to say, God, here I am in this moment. God, would you have your way, even over the things that I can't control, would you have your way in our community, God, in our country? God, we come to you at this very moment and we ask Jesus that you would just work on the hearts of people, that you would work in our hearts, that you would help us to live our lives in such a way, God, that glorifies you, that honors you.
promises never fail. Your promises never fail. You know, Psalm 27, verses 13 through 14 says, I am confident that I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. And then it says to wait patiently for the Lord. And then the psalmist says, be brave and courageous. And yes, once again, wait patiently for the Lord. You know, one of the things that I think about the pandemic and all of these different things that have happened, it's literally brought every single one of us to a place where we have to make a decision where we have to make a choice to say, <laughs> are we gonna try to continue to do things on our own strengths? Are we gonna continue to try and rely on our own gifts and our own talents and our own knowledge and all those different things? Or will we understand that there is a God who is greater than anything that we can control, greater than anything that may come along and may try to distract us or whatever it might be and we have come to a place where we have to make a choice to either say we're going to continue to try and hold on with everything that we have or we're going to say man God I need you because if we can get to that place to say God I need you God I surrender God I give it up to you can I encourage you today that when we let go when we cast all of our cares on him we cast all of our trouble, all of our worry, our fear, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, and we give it to God, can I let you know today that you can walk with confidence, that you can walk with a boldness to be brave, to be courageous, but then can I also let you know that you can walk with confidence to let, to, and assurance to know that, man, we will see God's goodness in spite of all of the tragedy, in spite of all of the chaos. But what does that take? It takes a heart that is surrendered, a heart that says, you know what, it's not about me, but it's about him, and it's about loving others. So can we make that a part of our heart cry today and our decision today to say, God, I will give you what you ask. I'll surrender my life to you. So Jesus, we thank you once again for this opportunity to worship, and we ask that you go before us today. That once again, as we've worshiped, as we've sung, you prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from your word. May you be glorified. In your precious name we pray, and everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us online today, for worshiping with us. We love you guys. Check out this next video. Hi, Newport Mesa. I'm Jenny Sumner. I'm an elder here at the church, and I have the privilege to invite you to give today to our church. And when you give, it's not only to what is happening within Newport Mesa, but around the world as we as a church also give 10%. We tithe on what we take in to magnify and multiply the impact of your giving around the world so that when you hear about what's happening in other parts of the world, you know that you're a huge part of that and it wouldn't happen without your generosity. So as we give today, it's like a magnifying glass on God's blessings in our lives. We can see again and again and again what he does, regardless of whether or not we are faithful, he is faithful over and over and over. So join with us as we give today and onward so that we can, we can carry on the message of Jesus around the world. So join with me in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for the work that you do in us and through us. Father, I pray that as we give today, that you would take these humble offerings, Lord, multiply them so that your work and your message can be shared to those around the world, to those in our own backyard, Lord Jesus, who need to know you. Father, we thank you and we pray all of these things in your holy name. Amen. To give from the Newport Mesa app, simply press the give icon located at the bottom of your screen in the center. Press give online and wait for the window to open.
Click continue and it will open up to a new window. And then choose which fund you would like it to go to. Type in your amount and fill out the rest of the information before clicking the submit button. Give on Church Online, simply go to the Give tab at the top of the page. Then it will open up newportmesa.org slash giving. Scroll down to where it says Give Online and click the button. Then it will open up a page where you can type in your amount and choose which fund you would like it to go to. Welcome to our online experience. My name is Jordan. I'm excited that you are tuning in. It is 10.30 Pacific Daily Time. Uh, You may be watching this later this evening or later this week, and I just wanted to welcome you. We are broadcasting live from Costa Mesa, California this morning, and we're actually starting a new series, and so I'm really excited about that. Our hope throughout this whole Really, the last five years since I've, since I've been here, but, you know, we've had a lot of things thrown at us in the last three months, and the last two weeks has gotten crazy, is that our, our mission is to grow in our relationship with Jesus uh, in our lives as a community that we would fulfill the mission of God for us. And so we're going to keep doing that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to actually turn with me to Philippians 1. But before I move towards the text and introduce the text formally, I want to be just, I want to have a moment where we have uh, just a really emphatically clear statement about the state of the world, about where we are at as a nation uh, in, re- in regards to the George Floyd murder. I want to make a statement on racism. Racism is sin. I want to be as clear as I possibly can. There is no place for racism in the kingdom of God. Racism is sin. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why is a pastor talking about uh, a political issue? And no, 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 it's not. It's not a political issue. It's a moral issue, just like sexuality is a moral issue. And I speak on sexuality, just like abortion is a, uh, a moral issue. And I because of God's calling on my life, I, I, I am bound to that spiritual authority to speak from God's word on these issues. It, it, just like how we care for the poor is a moral issue. And so, yes, these issues are, 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 are toyed with us in, in the political realm, but first and foremost, I must look at the world that I live in from a biblical worldview, and the Bible addresses these things. And so I just want you to know, I, I want to be as clear as I possibly can, that racism is sin. And so I want to give you four things that at minimum you can do this week, this month, and really for the rest of your life as we tackle these moral issues that God is transforming us uh, to be more and more like him. The first one, I want to just ask you, is to join us in repentance. These, we've had prayer meetings and personally just pray and ask God to forgive you of your willful participation or your ignorant participation. Sometimes we don't even realize how we are a part of something that is greater than what we are aware of. God's desire is to transform the way we think and act. And so we just want to reorient, repent of anything that misses the mark in our life. And racism misses the mark because all people are made in God's image too. I want to encourage you to listen. Just stop being the social media commando that you are and just listen Listen, this is a time for our church, for our community, for people who are on all sides of this to just stop and listen and learn. When the Ahmaud Arbery news came out, I started to interview people that I 
greatly respect and just to listen, to hear from their perspective. And so what we're going to do later this week is actually collect those interviews and send an email out because I know sometimes when you're trying to find online content, it's hard and, and maybe you haven't seen like where we've been involved our church knows if they've been walking with me for a while where I stand on this issue. But if you're tuning in just, just now for the very first time, um, I want you to know this is a, a longstanding passion of mine, that, that Jesus died for all people, that he loves black people, and that there is no place in the kingdom or the church where, where this kind of stuff is happening. And so in those interviews, we bring it back to think about these issues through a scriptural lens. Third, I want you to be a comfort to the black community. Some people are using this moment to lecture, and it's like, this is not the time for lectures. This is the moment to comfort our friends. Um, if my child uh, fell and skinned her knee, the first thing I would do is not ask her, why were you running? I, because kids run. I would run up to her and hold her close and, and let her cry in my arms. So this is very important for us. There needs to be empathy and compassion showed in our response. We must be a comforting presence to those who are truly hurting by this. You may not be hurting, but you can be a comfort to those who are. Uh, third, the second part of that is be a comfort to those who have friends and family or who are personally in police work. The reality is that there, yes, there are cops that use excessive force, just like there are teachers that abuse their students, just like there are preachers that do horrible things, and they, they do horrible things, and the last thing we want to do is judge every person because of one uh, moment, and so we want to be a comfort to police officers who are trying their hardest to um, keep law and order in our society. And this is a, it's a very hard time to do that with everything that is going on. So those are three things that you can do. You can repent, you can listen and learn, and you can be a comfort. And then finally, this is four, we can pray. This last Wednesday, uh, churches from 20 plus churches in Costa Mesa gathered around the flagpole uh, in City Hall. And we just prayed. We prayed that through this amazing prayer guide that guided us through repentance and reconciliation and redemption. I, I'm hoping that someone uh, who's hosting online can throw that resource up, but we can pray and, and we can actually be a part of spiritual transformation of people's hearts and, and, and not just respond in the moment. This is something that God wants to do in us. He's, he's right here with us. He wants to face this, but I want to encourage you, be a part of the movement to end racism. And, and to be frank, it's going to be around for a long time because people are broken and it's sin and sin doesn't get finally dealt with until the day of the Lord Jesus. But we don't have to let that be a part of our lives or the, the world of influence that we're a part of. So I want to encourage you with that. Please call someone you know and just be a comfort to them. Listen to them. Comfort their lives and hearts. Pray for them. That's, that's our hope. Um, with that, I actually want to pray for our church and for our nation right now. Lord, we lift up this situation to you. It is way beyond our ability to know how to move forward. But Jesus, you came and you willingly sacrificed your life because of agape love, sacrificial love that would, that would actually be an example for us, Lord, of what to do, how to follow you in your footsteps. And I pray that the church would, would carry their cross right now, Lord, in this area, and we would follow you, Jesus. And I just pray that you would bring comfort to those who are hurting, Lord, that you would, that you would help us be good listeners and, and to, to be educated on these issues, Lord, bring your awareness into our world. And Lord, finally, we just lift our hearts up to you and we ask that you would heal us of our, of our own heart's inclinations towards believing this or that. I pray that you would, God, reorient our entire way of thinking around you. We, re we repent in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am, I'm just firmly convinced that God will use all of the news events of today to help us in our journey grow closer and closer to Jesus. And, and really, that's our hope as Christians. That's our hope as a church. That's our desire as a church, to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And so when these things pop up, we, we do our absolute best to say, how am I complicit in this? Where, where, where am I involved in this? How can I just be innocent of this before God? And how can I love my neighbor as myself? And so we just want to continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus because that's going to enable and empower us to love people the way that God desires to love them 
through us. With that said, our major way that we grow is we just turn the pages. Since uh, I, I showed up in 2015, um, we've just been turning the pages. This church has a long history of turning the pages, of, of just studying books, studying passages of Scripture. We've gone through Jude. We've gone through Daniel. We've gone through the book of Jonah, the book of Colossians, the book of Mark, the book of Nehemiah. And today I'm excited to announce that we are going to start a journey through the book of Philippians. Now, Philippians um, is a book in the New Testament that Paul wrote while in prison, likely in Rome. And what makes it unique is that he talks a lot about joy. 14 times he uses the word joy in the book of Philippians. And that is out of 35 times total out of all of his books. So almost half of his usage of that particular word is found in the book of Philippians. It would be premature for me to tell you that joy is the point of the book of Philippians. Really, the point is, the reason that Paul is writing is he wants to reconnect with this church that he started. You can read about that church, by the way, in Acts chapter 16. If you want to hear the story about how he got a vision and he went into Macedonia, this is really the first Roman city that he planted a church in. He met a woman named Lydia on the outskirts of town where there were, was a place of prayer. And this Jewish woman came to Christ and a church was started. Um, and eventually other people that, that he would meet from this church would come into his life. Euodia, Syntyche, Clement. He brought Timothy here. Epaphrodites is a big character in this book. And he writes because while he's sitting basically on, on death row, he's about to be tried in Rome, he sends a letter to the Philippians because he wants to thank them. But in his letter to them, he wants also to address some of the conflicts that are arising in the church. Because for Paul, it is very important that he addresses these specific issues that he sees holding the church back. So there's a reason why I would address racism because it holds the church back. It prevents the church being unified under Christ. And so Paul is doing the exact same thing here with the Philippians, and we're going to spend the summer really looking into the issues that were dividing the book of Philippians. But it would be, uh, it, I, I have to just tell you that joy is a part of his solution. And Paul somehow is experiencing joy right there in the midst of being in prison while he's writing this letter because of his relationship with this, these people. And so I want to connect joy throughout this summer to a lot of the, really some of the most famous passages in this particular book and really in the New Testament and apply them to our lives. So I want you to again open up to Philippians chapter one as we dive into some of the conflict. We're not going to get into most of it today, but we're going to dive into some of it because Paul starts to build his case through his thanksgiving and prayer and then we're going to apply that to our lives. So here we go. We're going to start in chapter one, verse one. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi and the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, this is a common type of letter that Paul would have written. It is, could be considered a letter of friendship where you have two people, the highest level of relationship that two people could have uh, in, in Paul's day and the, the genre of literature seems to reflect that. It also could be considered a letter of moral exhortation where Paul, who is a spiritual mentor to these people, he is speaking into their lives where they are struggling. And it starts off like a lot of letters uh, to his churches that Paul writes. There is a greeting. There is a recipient. And Paul uh, explains himself, the author, except he does a few unique things. And before we continue with, with verse three, I just want to point them out. The first thing he does is he includes Timothy and a description of him and Timothy in uh, in his categorization of where this letter is coming from. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So here we go at the very start, because one of the things that we're going to discover is there's a lot of pride in the Philippian church. There, there are some things that are dividing people and people just will not. They refuse to humble themselves and to serve each other and to acknowledge the humanity in each other. And here he, he starts off by saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. Isn't that interesting that he would connect being a servant of Christ to his letter right off the, the, the top of this thing? And you're going to see how humility really becomes one of the themes to a solution to the, the problem that this church in Philippi is having. He goes on to say, to all the saints, hagio, hagio, holy ones. 
I love that because some people come into church and they think saints are the people that we canonize. And that's not scriptural, actually. Saints, according to the New Testament, are those who have found themselves in Christ and they are labeled hagio or, or holy ones, set apart ones, people who have given their hearts and their lives to Jesus. So here's the crazy thing. You might be reading this this letter, you might be sitting in Costa Mesa or Huntington Beach or Garden Grove or whatever. You may, have, you may be sitting on death row. You may be having all sorts of things in your life that you're not proud of. And if this letter were to be written to you and you've given your life to Jesus, Paul would say the same thing. You are a saint. You have been granted the unmerited favor of your life, but the, the favor of Jesus on your life because of what he has done for you. you. You are holy, set apart because of what Christ has done for you. So again, so much packed into here in this, these first two verses. To the saints of Christ in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi and with the overseers and deacons. Again, he's going to address some specific things happening in the leadership here. Grace to you, unmerited favor, and peace from God or reconciliation that comes only from the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the first two verses, we, if I, I mean, we could just spend a lot more time on this. I'm going to keep plowing, but some unique things here in this letter. Uh, let's go to verse three. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Now, one of the things that I'm hoping we'll do as we go along this summer is I want you to circle every time Paul uses that word joy. Again, there's going to be 14 times that we circle that word. Just so you can go back and connect the dots between the words and understand the context in which how this guy sitting in prison can talk about joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment, in the defense of the gospel, and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, I want to take a moment and let's unpack Paul's uh, expression of thanksgiving for them with joy. Now, before I jump into this, I just want you to know I'm going to reference a Bible project video every single week. And I didn't show it this time because it was nine minutes. It's, it's pretty lengthy, but I do want to point you to it. In fact, our online hosts uh, have a link that, that they can post right now that you can watch afterwards. I think it would be very beneficial for you as, as the weeks progress to not only read the letter of Philippians, which will take you about 10 minutes in one sitting, but read it multiple times and watch the Bible Project video. Let's just dive into this incredible book because there are some incredible verses, powerful spiritual promises and spiritual truths that I believe is, as they really get into our hearts, they will transform us from the inside out. So I want to do two things today, really. I want to look at Paul's Thanksgiving. I want to look at Paul's prayer and kind of look at the factors that are there because I'm just going to tell you what people... Uh, what people thank God for and what people pray for gives you a huge clue as to what they are invested in. So if we want to really understand how Paul is experiencing joy in the middle of a prison, it benefits us to look, especially with the Thanksgiving, because it says he's thanking them with joy. How does he get to the point where he has joy? Let's look at that. And then second, let's look at what the contents of Paul's prayer. And then let's try to figure out how to apply that to today's situation, even with everything that's going on, there's so much that is so applicable for us. So number one, and there's three things in his thanksgiving that Paul references. Uh, his expression of thanksgiving is specifically for the relationships that he has built in this community. Now, I've already told you, this is a community that he has been instrumental in starting. It was on one of his missionary journeys that, that he and a group of his uh, partners showed up in the, the Roman city of Philippi and they started a church. My defini definition of church is just a family or a community of people that are on mission. And they're, they are partnered together to see God's work, God's heavenly work, his kingdom work invade earth. And so he is expressing 
thanksgiving for these people that he's lived his life with. And this, these are the three things specifically. He thanks God for their partnership in the gospel, right? This is what I would consider mission. This is actually why we call official, like the official commitment step for our people. If they're like, yeah, I, I feel called, committed to be a part of Newport Mesa Church. We invite people into a formal covenant that says, I am committed to being a partner in the gospel with Newport Mesa Church. And this is what, this is literally what Paul is saying about these people that he loves so much in Philippi. And isn't it true that people who we have bled with, people that we have served with, people that we have loved with, people that we have built something with, rather, I mean, you could be sitting in your chair right now next to your wife or your husband, and the same thing is true. If you want a strong community, a strong covenant relationship, you have got to have a partnership in things that matter. And for us as a church, our mission is, is, is to proclaim the gospel, to see transformation, to bring Jesus in the flesh to the earth where we live. One of the ways that we did that just this last week is we partnered with one of our community members or community partners, Orlando Sanchez. And just in the last, this is not a joke, in the last five days, we have partnered and many in our church who have partnered with Orlando, we've been able to deliver 55,450 pounds. That is almost 30 tons of fresh produce, milk, cheese, and foodstuffs, throw 200 plus Domino's pizzas in there, or actually, yeah, a lot of pizza. And in the last five days alone in Lake Forest, Fullerton, Santa Ana, Huntington Beach, Paul Arino Elementary School, Whittier Elementary School, the Shalimar neighborhood, because that's what God's called us to. Here Paul is in the middle of a prison and he's thinking about how much this group of Philippians have partnered with him. They're not just sitting on the sideline, like just giving him critical and negative feedback. They have literally given, they've sacrificed. They are with him. And Paul says, I'm thankful for this. The second thing he's thankful for is his confidence in God to work things out. You know, I can't imagine being uh, in a situation like Paul is and he's hearing about the conflict that he's having, this struggle between two leaders in a church that he loves and they're like this, they're going at each other. Why? Because they have differences of opinions. Some people, they, they come into church thinking like this is gonna be perfect harmony. Where did we get that idea? Anytime you put 10 people in the same room, you're gonna have 10 different opinions. Anytime you put 100 people, the more people you have in the same room, the more likely it is that there will be conflict. But this is where Paul's confidence lies, that even though there is conflict, his confidence is in God to work things out in them. Verse six, this is one of those memory verses that I, you learn as a child. If you've never learned this memory, you need to understand this, that what God wants to do in here it is, is, is important for us to realize that even when we're faithless, God will be faithful. If we just keep coming back to him as vagabonds of his grace, as, as desperate people in need, God, open our eyes to this racism issue in our land. Friends, if you cannot pray that, that speaks volumes to where you're at. There should be nothing that prevents us. God, open my eyes to see the world the way that you see. Just pray that. And this is where Paul's confidence lies that God will work things out. When he has soil in his hand to shape and to mold, he will chip away, he will mold, he'll shape, and God will be confident to work things out. And there's a phrase that's used twice here on the day of the Lord. And it's here in his thanksgiving and it's here later in his praise. But it's a reminder to us that this is God's timeline, not us. Sometimes we want things to be done today and there should be an urgency about the way we live. But Paul is convinced that this is a process and it goes all the way up until the day of the Lord. So he's confident in God's ability to work things out. Third, he's confident or, or he's grateful for the close relationship of intimacy that he's built up with these people who have stood by him. They've bled with him. They have a, con, a, common, a common opposition, right? So he's sitting in a Roman jail cell. They're in a Roman city and they're definitely facing the pressure from their community to bow down to Caesar. The Caesar cult is alive and well. They even called Caesar Lord and Savior. Can you imagine that? And so they have a common uh, opposition and, and, and they recognize that they are together in this. So again, people give thanks for things that they have invested in when they are pointing it out. And these are the things that Paul 
starts off his letter with. I'm grateful that there's a partnership in this mission. I'm grateful that God's going to work it out. And I'm just grateful for all of the relationships that I've built with all of these people. Here you see Paul's definition of church. It coincides with my definition. A Jesus commissioned community. That's literally what Newport Mesa Church is. We are a group of individuals that have been commissioned by God to walk this mission out together. It's not just a community because that becomes inbred and it's not just a mission because you get tired and you get dried up. It's a community on a mission. And when a community has that kind of direction, it's able to experience the kind of blessing that God has for it. So Paul expresses his thanksgiving for them with joy. He is invested in this church in Philippi. He's grateful for them. This is his prayer, verse nine. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. Listen to that. The fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. Not our own strength, not our own power. It comes through Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So let's, we've looked at Paul's thanksgiving. Let's look at Paul's prayer. Specifically, Paul prays for his community of Christian relationships. I love, I, I, I love Paul's intentionality with this prayer here. It's, it's, it's not random. It's, it's very specific. He's, he's addressing things. How many of you have called up your mom or your dad or a spiritual mentor and you're explaining this issue that, that, that you have in your life and you ask them to pray for you and they end up preaching to you in their prayer? That's literally what Paul is doing here. My mom would do that all the time. In fact, she already texted me after the first service. Jordan, I heard that. It's okay. When, when, in a letter of moral exhortation, that's what they're supposed to do. So when you ask an elder or a, sp or a spiritual mentor to pray for you, man, I'm praying that they give you some advice. I remember one time I, I asked mom, Lord, I, or mom, I'm having this issue with this girlfriend. I'm in high school. And then she prayed for me. And this is what she prayed. Jesus, I just pray against this relationship. I pray that you would give my son some sense and that he would end it. So you know what? Sometimes they get preaching and it's okay. Paul's preaching here. So let's, let's just take a moment and see what he's preaching through his prayer. First of all, he really is praying that these people lead with love. In any conflict, it's just, you don't start with fighting for your rights. You start by leading in love. You start with love, agape love. This is, this, all of the book of Philippians is really going to be based around this beautiful poem of uh, Jesus becoming flesh in chapter two. And all of it really takes a good, hard, strong look at the God of the universe who becomes flesh and serves. Remember that description of Paul and Timothy in verse one? Servants of Christ. How do we, how are we servants in the world that we live in? We lead with love. And this is how he describes love. Love that is knowledgeable and discerning. Just, just look at verse nine. If you cannot characterize your love right now during all of the racial unrest that is happening by those two characteristics there you need to you need to maybe be in the book of philippians knowledgeable we grow in knowledge by listening we grow in knowledge by learning we referenced that earlier we grow in knowledge by getting in god's word and letting the holy spirit speak to us and we grow in discernment which is a gift of the spirit also as we learn the difference between right and wrong there's lots of areas of morality that God wants to speak very specifically to us. There are some areas that are more gray, and it, it may just depend. But there are a lot of areas that are just, they're moral absolutes. God asks us to take a stand, and it's not something that we um, can back out of. Uh, the reason for leading with love is that whether or not we are proactive in our uh, blessing of something or we're silent, um, Paul is, is advocating here, he's praying that the Philippians are able to uh, bless what is happening, put their stamp of approval on what is most excellent. And there is a moral quality to that word, which in the ESV is translated as excellent. Uh, the NIV translated, translates it as best. Like, there, not everything in this world is good, but there are some things that are good. And as Christians, as Philippians, I want you to put your blessing on the things that God would say is good. I want you to be very proactive about approving and making sure everyone knows what we approve of. 
Can I just be very clear? We're against racism, and we are for the inclusion of all people, that all people would be able to experience the promises of God. And if there's a group of people that feel hurt and broken, and if that is the black community, that you better believe I will do whatever it is necessary to make sure that the black community knows that they are one of us, that they are a part of us. And I I will not budge on that. And I believe the church of Jesus Christ, that will be something that is true forever. If you don't believe me, just look at the throne room of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Every tribe, every language. And you know what's interesting that God does? He doesn't get rid of diversity. He celebrates it. There are still tribes and tongues and languages around the throne. There are black people. There are white people. There are brown people. There are. I even think there's going to be sign language in heaven because it's a culture and a language that has developed. Uh, I'm just telling you, it's, this is very, very important for us to bless the good things in this world that we are seeing. If we see the world acknowledge that something is bad, man, let's just bless that. Yeah, the church can get on board with that. This happened last year when the whole Me Too movement happened. I don't believe it's God's will for anybody to experience sexual harassment, period. That's something that I can get on board with. That's that's easy to bless. And this is why Paul says this in verse 10b, because we will be accountable to God for everything that we've blessed and what we've stayed silent on. It's important that we ask this question, how will God judge me? Don't ask yourself, how will God judge the church? Ask yourself as a father, as a mother, as a family. You've raised kids, you're a teacher in a a school, you're, you're leading an organization, whatever it is that you're doing, how will God judge me during this season? In this particular season, how will God judge me? It's very important, this timeline that Paul introduces here. The day of the Lord is coming. We don't know when or where or how, but it's, it's in our future and God will hold us all accountable for what we've allowed to have happen, happen. And this is the ultimate purpose. And Paul, I love how Paul brings this into fruition because he always has his vision on this. Because bearing fruit through Jesus that points people to the amazing God that we serve is the point. So I want you to experience joy in this season because I believe that it's a fruit of the Spirit that will bring quality and fulfillment to you, to your marriage, to your job. Joy makes life fun. I mean, didn't you feel that just a little bit? You're listening to this video and you've got this Islander music and you just start to dance and you have this emotion that naturally responds. But as I'm listening to what Paul is thanking God for and what he's praying for for this Christian uh, community, I'm seeing this, this, this idea of fruit being born through the deep work of Jesus in us, not just for us, but so that others can see what God can do even in hard places. We, we really talked a lot about this this last week as we talked about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and being a witness in word and deed so that other people can know what's available to them. This fruit of the Spirit, this joy, whether it's joy or any of the other characteristics of God that happens when the Holy Spirit shapes us to be like Him, this is what people long for. They long to see this. In tough times, people long to see joy. And I'll be honest, there, this is one of those fruits of the Spirit that I've always personally struggled with, especially the last three months. There are people in my life that I think just are so amazing at this. Sharon Noble's one. If you've ever come to the office during the day, I guarantee you, you're going to hear her laugh at some point, and it just brings joy to your life. And so she's sitting right over here, so I'm messing with her. But I'm just so grateful for the people in my life that have given me an example. So again, we see a, a, a clue here at the beginning of this book and, and the first mention of the word joy. What someone thanks God for and what someone prays for are huge clues as to what they have invested their life in. So if Paul is experiencing joy because he's thankful for the community that's on a mission that, that he is addressing, there's a connection there. If Paul is praying that this Christian community stands up for what God is asking them to stand for, that they would be accountable to this timeline that God has placed on our lives, that they would, because of what Jesus has done in us, bear the fruit that would be so beautiful to the people who are living in our lives. Again, we get a huge clue into what Paul has invested his life in. Let's just take a step back. Paul is definitely someone who was not living the Christian life. 
We're going to talk a lot more about this next week, but I just want to briefly summarize. Paul grew up a Jewish person. He, he grew up someone who hated Christians. When this sect came onto the scene, he was a persecutor of Christians. But Jesus radically transformed him on the road to Damascus. God got in his face and said, what are you doing, Paul? Live for me. And because of this radical experience that Paul had with Jesus, he's playing catch up. <laughs> he's playing catch up. And Philippi is one of those communities that is, the, that is the benefit of how intensely Paul is living for Jesus. And here at the end of his life, he's imprisoned. He's on death row, if you will. He's writing to one of his favorite communities of people. And, and he keeps linking joy to their community, to their mission, to the relationships that he's built, to the work of God that he's seen done in them. He's connecting this fruit of the Spirit to what God has done in this group of people living out the gospel together. Could it be that one of the biggest and uh, I don't want to say easy because it's anything but easy, but the, but the simplest paths toward the fruit of the Spirit is to be invested in the church of Jesus and the mission of the church. Could it be that simple? I want you to watch this video. I'm Renee Dallas, and I'm the women's ministry group, small group, person. I uh, had the pleasure of leading a group of women this last season, and uh, we went through quite an adventure together. I want to introduce you to Robin. Hi. And Angel the Rockstar Cordero. Hi. How are you? So uh, we started our group uh, when things were sort of normal. We uh, decided to go through the rooted uh, curriculum where we just kind of went through the basics of the faith and uh, uh, during that time transitioned over to a COVID response and had to social distance but we managed to stay together the whole time. Well I think it's awesome I can remember a setting in November in um, Fellowship Hall thinking okay how are we going to do something remote um, if we aren't in a facility and it was awesome to see the Holy Spirit working to um, know that he was planning something if we were obedient. And sure enough, there came Zoom out of your mouth to say, hey, let's do a Zoom. And it was before COVID. So uh, God knew what he was doing for sure. Right, and so we had um, Robin joining us, even though she was on the East Coast, the rest of us were in, uh, was at Huntington Beach in a living room and we had Robin joining us on a screen from my iPad, and I turned her around and I had her face the whole group. Everybody's sitting on chairs and they could see her on the iPad. And we just had a great time. We, we interacted great. We talked, we laughed, we shared all of our thoughts about the Bible study, and it seemed to work pretty well. Little did we know what was going to come down the pike to us to uh, impact the way we met. What a blessing for me being all the way over on the East Coast for the last six years with my family to be able to log into Zoom and essentially I'm right there in the living room with you guys and everybody's interacting with me through the computer or the phone. And that first Zoom call really cemented the fact that many years ago when I joined a small group, I met Angel, I met Renee, I mean, going on 12 to 15 years now, it really, even living on the other side of the country, it brought me right back into the group with the ladies. You guys have been there with me through so many different seasons of my life, and I'm just so thankful for it every day and to be a part of the group, even though I'm not in the same city. We had um, a lot of prayer time together. I think the group just really bonded from day one. We just really hit it off with each other. Um, I think we all felt what each other was going through when we had our prayer request time. And uh, we had uh, times where we had a little prayer retreat. We all went into different rooms, prayed, and then came back together. Um, we shared each other's story. Hear you. We, had, we had a great time of sharing each other's story. Um, each person uh, really had some unique things to bring to the group no two stories alike 
And I love that we all were really accepting of each other and really welcomed each other's stories. Um, that was one of the one thing, great things that we did. And then after uh, we got done with Rooted, COVID hit, we decided, well, we'll just finish up our Rooted and we're just gonna keep going. That was uh, a really wonderful thing that we could just keep going and talk about what we were going through. Yeah, and I think what the small groups do is they really create a safe space. Everyone, it, it kind of takes a week or two, but everyone gets to know each other. They get to have a level of vulnerability that is kept within that space. And I think it's been a great place. Every group I've been a part of, it's been a great place for women to come or couples to come and really be able to share what they're going through or ask for prayer for a season of time they're in. And I mean, this group has been wonderful in my life and I, I would highly recommend it to anybody who wants to join a small group or who needs that kind of small community to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I love about Philippians where he says, uh, I remember you with joy. That's one of the things that I think we all have for each other because we kind of ended up going on an adventure together. You know, it wasn't just your regular everyday season to go through small group, you know, and we had to make adjustments and um, it was fun. I loved the roller coaster. I loved it all. And I think that's one thing that we're always going to remember about each other. We're going to remember what we went through and how we got through it. Right. And I think at the end of the day, every week, something new happens, something funny happens, somebody has a story to share. And that's really the bonding and the connecting and, you know, it's kind of happening right now. <laughs> Yeah, we just decided like one day after COVID started, we're like, how was your week? We just spent all that time, like the first part of the group, just like venting about how our week went. And then actually when we got into the Bible study part, everything made better sense. It was amazing how the Holy Spirit led that time. We really loved being together. We loved going through the Psalms of Ascent, how relevant they were. Um, when it was about how God is looking over his people and how he's taking care of us in the middle of a pandemic and how it boosts our faith and how we could talk about what we were journaling on and the different Psalms and uh, pray for very specific things. Um, so that was part of the adventure. When we invest in Jesus commissioned communities, there is a return in joy for the long haul. Now, I can already hear you objecting. Yeah, I've tried church. I've tried a small group. I've tried people and I've gotten burned. Can I tell you as the lead pastor of the church, that's all true for me too. Yep, 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 yep. But that's just people. People are messy. But so is investment. Every investment that you will ever make is a risk. I want you to think about when this COVID thing first happened. Remember how the how the stock market went, I think if you would have jumped into the stock market on March 13th, if you've looked at the stock market recently, you would have made a, actually a, a really good return since March 13th. Because here's one of the major principles of investing, the best time to invest is at a low point. Here's what I wanna say to people who are trying to figure out what this, this, this new season looks like. You're, you're experiencing COVID, this pandemic. Now you've got this racial unrest. There's so much chaos and you just feel disconnected and you've had these bad experiences. Friends, everybody feel, everyone is at this low point, but there is going to be so much return on the value of your investment. I'm talking about your investment in relationships, your investment in the mission of God, your investment in commissioned communities of Jesus, like Newport Mesa Church or whatever church it is that you feel God is leading you to be a part of a local expression of relationships, of, of people who are living life together, who consider themselves family. There is gonna be a huge return on joy if you go all in, because this is such a low point in our society. <coughs> I think that the best time to invest is at a low point. But there's also some other ways to invest. My, uh, my financial advisor is always telling me about dollar cost averaging. What is dollar cost averaging? Where, where you invest consistently. This would be like if my daughter, I grabbed this from her room. Don't worry, I'll take it back. 
And she put in, if I give her a quarter every day, she put in a quarter every single day. You know, and she just invested, 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 invested. You know, at the end of the day, this is a great way to save, but it doesn't multiply your money at all. But if you invest in the stock market over the course of the long haul, you dollar cost average your investment, there will be a multiplication that happens. And so we invest early, right? When things are low, but we also invest when we're young. And if you invest when you're young, it'll grow more, but we invest consistently. If we do these things with the church, if we invest our lives in relationships and the mission of God, if we go on a missions trip, if we join a dream team, if we join a small group, well, we have a bad experience there and we take it two steps back, but then we come back and do this. And it's just consistent, consistent, and consistent. We will experience a harvest of joy in that community over the long haul. I've heard it said that we overestimate what we can do in the short term. And we underestimate what we can do in the long term. When I start talking about investments, I'm not talking about a short-term strategy. Ah, people who are done with the church, they'll come up to me and say they, they, they've had it with the church. They had this or that, or they, they talk about their marriage or their business or whatever. And I ha always have to ask them, whose timeline are, your work, are you working on, yours or God's? Because Paul keeps bringing in this day of the Lord thing, like it's this reminder that there's a timeline that's bigger than ours. If we're on God's uh, timeline, then our investment strategy has to change. We invest when times are low. We invest early. That's why we, again, we invest so much in kids' ministry. We want to plant those seeds. We invest consistently and we just don't give up. I want to encourage you today to challenge you. This is a moment where you're just tapped out, you're tired, but don't give up, don't give in. It's hard, but it's worth it. Paul is at the end of his rope and he's writing from this place that is literally a prison and he's sending this message through Epaphrodites. Don't give up. This is how I'm praying for the mission of God to be worked out in your life. This is why I'm grateful. This is what I'm praying for you. Don't give up. A couple months ago, actually a couple years ago, I did a celebration of life service for a woman who's impacted our church in, in profound ways. She was one of those women that no matter what day it was, she always had a smile and could make you laugh. Her name was Johanna Townsend. Actually, that was Sharon's mentor. So now you know why there's so much joy there. And that fruit was transmitted from one woman to the next woman because they lived life together. They went on missions trips together. They did vacation Bible schools together. They had dinner in people's homes. They were invested in each other. And they invested in each other when times were good. And they invested in each other when times were bad. And this is what our relationship as the expression of the body of Christ is. We are the body when times are good. We're the body when times are bad. If you're on the outskirts of walking away from a church, can I just be so bold as to tell you you're able to walk away because you don't have roots or an investment there. If you want to know why it's so easy, that's why. If you want to know why it's so hard to leave a church, it's the same reason. It's because when God plants us in a community, he asks us to put our roots down. He asks us to invest in the relationships of people around us, to serve, to pour our hearts out, to give financially, to serve with all of our hearts, to join a dream team, to go out with Orlando and the neighborhoods, whatever it is that God's called you uniquely to do and to be a part of the body. Someone asked me, a young person asked me, they said, how in the world did so many people show up for, for Johanna's memorial service? And you know, I didn't have an answer right away, but I started thinking about it because one person said she had done 43 vacation Bible schools and another person said that she had gone on all these missions trips and 30 plus years of ministry and come to think of it, when I first got here, she was literally the person that came into my office and said, Jordan, we need to remodel those bathrooms. They look like they've just been painted with lipstick and we need to put something better in there, you know? And she just, but, but here's the thing. She said it with a smile and so much joy in her heart. I said, oh, okay, you know, like she's just recruiting me. You know, if you ever gone out to lunch with someone who you knew they were gonna recruit you to do some ministry position and sure enough they did and it ended up being a, a season of your life where you were invested in and you were poured out into the lives of other people. Johanna Townsend had so much joy in her life because I believe that she was fully invested in Jesus Commission communities. This church, I'm not saying that you're called to this church. I'm just saying you are called to a Jesus Commission community where God can pour out through you. He can pour into you. As I think about Paul and his investment, 
I have to conclude that he made a wise one over the course of his life as he poured his life out into the lives of people, as he poured his life out for the mission of God. And that's God's work in us. He works through relationships. He works through mission. He works through our decision to follow Jesus. How does God bring joy through investment? Yeah, there's gonna be some small groups that don't work out. Keep signing up, keep being a part, keep leading, take more responsibility, not less. Join some kind of redemptive activity that you can do mission with other people. Serve. This is something that you can do this week. Orlando needs people for the next month. People are gonna need food for the next month. And there's all sorts of other areas. Call someone who is hurting from this racial situation and be the extension of Jesus Christ to them over the phone. Pray for them. Serve on mission. If you're sitting at home thinking, I've never made a decision to follow Christ, I wanna tell you there's, I'm not gonna promise an easy journey. Being the church is not easy. Being a follower of Jesus is not easy, but it's worth it. Over the long haul, you will experience fruit in ways that you've never experienced. In 1980, Eugene Peterson wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And friends, a long obedience has to start with that decision to say, Jesus, I will follow you. God incarnate who became a servant and has been that servant through so many of our leaders as we follow them, as they follow Christ, as we follow Christ, as we fulfill our purpose in this world by being a servant, by being humble, by being everything that God's called us to be, God will bear fruit in us. He's faithful. I want to invite you to follow Jesus today. Would you say a simple prayer with me? Jesus, we choose today to make you Lord and Savior of our lives. We're either praying that prayer as a first-time commitment or we are recommitting ourselves to you, Jesus. And it's not just a prayer to follow you, seated at the right hand next to the Father, but we are also making a commitment to walk with the church, the body of Christ, the, the, the physical expression of Jesus on this planet. We're committing ourselves to actually be a part of a local assembly, a local body, a local group, a co-commission group of Jesus followers on mission. Father, solidify that in us and deepen that investment as we pour out. We pray that you would pour into us and just bring this, this fruit of the Spirit out in our life. Help us to experience it, Lord. Help there to be a huge harvest in this next season as we invest at this low point in where our nation is at, as we invest in the next generation, as we invest consistently helping people to grow in their relationship with Jesus, I pray that, Jesus, that you would bring your blessing into our lives. We pray in your name. Amen. Friends, it doesn't stop with a prayer. This week, I want you to take me up on that invitation. Join a group. Contact our church office and say, how can I help? How can I serve? How can I be a part of some dream team and, and be a part of what God wants to do in the world? Be someone who acts and not just listens. With that said, our hosts are gonna be posting the five questions. Process these questions in small groups and with your family and make God's word the standard of the way that you live your life too. God bless you this week. We want to thank you for joining us today. Here at Newport Mesa Church, we're all about changed lives. Did this message encourage you? We'd love to hear about your story. Connect with us on our webpage or email us at info at newportmesa.org. If you'd like to support the ministry here, you can give through our website or our mobile app. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you next week.